I now move to questions to the Minister of Education. I call Linda Dillon. Linda Dillon. Question number one. I thank the member for her question. On the definition used by NISRA in terms of rules, because the, there are two definitions, members will be aware, which are now trying to align uh, on rural and urban within education. But based on the NISRA statistic, there is one uh, primary school which currently receives funding from the Department for a Nurture Group. That is uh, St Oliver Plunkett's Primary School in the North West. Uh, on the I suppose the other definition, which is sometimes used for sustainability between urban and rural, which may be a little bit out of date. Uh, of the original 31, I think about 22 would have been uh, deemed as urban, and on the new 15, five are Belfast based and 10 are based outside of Belfast. But in addition to the direct funding on the, uh, for a nurture group within the school, uh, as part of the process of funding uh, this year and ongoing, all educational settings, including rural primary schools, will have access to a nurture approach in education uh, programme throughout the education. Uh, authority, the aim is to try and mainstream it across the board within schools. Supplementary, Linda Dillon. Gormagut, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Could the Minister confirm that a full rural proofing exercise was carried out? And I, I understand what you're saying in terms of the, the first and second definition. I think the second definition can be ruled out in that it is considered by some departments that anything outside Belfast is rural, and that is not the case. I, I would understand. also invite the Minister to see an, an excellent example in a rural area, which is in St Mary's in Pomeroy. If you would come to visit, we would really appreciate it. Look, as the member knows, I was dealing with a couple of those issues. Uh, the position in terms of the uh, most recent set of, um, uh, of the most recent announcements is that, still in terms of some of the implementation, that is subject to business case. Um, and as part of that, Process there will be a, uh, there is a rural needs impact assessment along with the quality impact assessment that will take place. I should say on the basis of the criteria that have been used, um, they are criteria indeed used in the previous set, which have been in existence for a number of years. As to uh, if you like, uh, it's effectively as was a competition for um, nurture units because funding is not infinite in that in that regard. So there is a system where criteria uh, was produced a number of years ago. That is ongoing, and, and schools are therefore ranked against that, uh, against that criteria. Specifically on the um, urban-rural definitional split, I, I think that, particularly as regards um, issues around sustainability, where it's, it's been anything within uh, the old um, city council area in the northwest and Belfast were counted as urban, anything else was counted as rural. I think there is a good argument that's out of date, and I've recently signed off on a proposal to change that. So that, so that we try and align the, um, the definition of urban and rural with the notion of statistics so it's consistent across the board. Um, and as regards the uh, invitation to Pomeroy, if uh, an invitation can be put into the system officially from the school, I'll be happy to come down to uh, Pomeroy uh, to see. I'm sure there are many schools that are providing very good services, but I'll be happy to visit uh, the school in Pomeroy. I call Justin McNulty. Can Corla and thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Can the Minister confirm if there are plans to bolster existing Irish language nurture units and whether there are plans to open more in the future? Well, the position, I think, is that all groups should be treated on the basis of equality. There were originally, I think, in different sections of um, funding in terms of nurture units, I think originally 20, then it moved to 30, then to 32. Uh, I think there's, of those 32, one dropped out of it, and there's recently been another 15 that has been put in place. There is objective criteria which is used and has been used from the start in terms of, an, of those two are Irish medium uh, nurture schools. I think all schools are treated according to the, the set criteria um, and then treated, treated equally because I think that in terms of opportunities, whether you go to a controlled school, a maintained school, an integrated school, an Irish medium school, it is on the basis of, of how those schools meet that criteria to qualify for a nurture unit, because nobody, I think, should feel that, that either they are being superseded or alternatively being unfairly leapt over in that regard. And it would continue to be that it, uh, objective criteria will apply in establishing any form of ranked order for, for nurture units. We've seen a, a level of expansion. I think it has been widely accepted that, that nurture units, and that is why we're trying to mainstream this across um, all schools, have been something which has been very successful, and I think something that um, not just in terms of short-term success, but will bear long-term dividends. 
as opposed to all ministers, it's a question of what the level of constraints are there in terms of funding, because if there was money to fund another 50 nurture units, I think myself or indeed any minister would be happy to do that. And we have been able to get um, 15 nurture units progressed um, at the moment on it. Uh, I think, and I'm meeting with the finance minister to discuss next year's budget after this, um, it's probably unlikely that there will be a, a massive additional expansion given sort of some of the other pressures that are there. But any additional units will always be judged according to uh, how they rank in terms of criteria, which will always mean, depending on what is available, that one school will arrive at being the final one funded and then the next is the next in line in terms of below that. I call Robbie Butler. Mr Speaker, given the success of nurture units and early intervention with pupils, uh, would the Minister uh, like to give a commitment that he might expedite the legislative change for flexibility in school age, uh, start especially for premature children? I'm very keen to, to look at that. Obviously, as with a lot of things, the focus has been so much on COVID that they've been able to develop policy. But I am sympathetic to a situation that there is something that needs to be done, whether that's the legislative basis or whether that can be done in a you know, a different way, which doesn't necessarily require legislation, we we'll need to look at. But doing something around uh, a greater level of flexibility in this, on the starting age within limited circumstances, because yes. I think if you were simply make that very open-ended, then I think that could be very disruptive to the school system. But I think there are some tough cases which I think do need. There isn't a level of flexibility that there, there it's present, and so it would be something I'd be happy to take a look at. Oh, William Humphrey. So far. Uh, can I declare that this is a, a governor at Edinburgh Primary School which has a nurture unit and I also thank the Minister for extending that to Glenwood Primary School. Minister, you have said in an earlier answer to question about the constraint you have in terms of finance. Given the, the expert um, panel that is looking at uh, the issue around educational underachievement, can I ask the Minister, can he look at the outcomes of that, given that early interventions are cheaper and better? That perhaps there could be some monies freed around the report and uh, locking of monies that might come at that time in the publication of such a report? Me, as part of that, and um, I, obviously I can't prejudge any outcome that the panel will come out with. However, I think it is quite likely that any panel will want to look towards, um, if we're looking at particularly issues around underachievement, um, and I should say as well, some of the advantages of nurture are not purely on the basis of where there can be educational achievement directly, but also has a very major social impact on particularly uh, disadvantaged um, young people. It, 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 it is sort of a potential win-win. Uh, as such, I think I'll want to look at whatever proposals come out of that. Um, I think it is likely that there will be some level of commitment uh, from any panel towards earlier interventions, which may well lead in terms of that to nurture units. Clearly, as part of that, um, as the report would be due to complete in May, it would then require additional funding from uh, the next year's budgetary settlement. And I think it has been accepted in terms of proposals that we have put forward, although we don't know what the exact nature will come out of the uh, educational underachievement panel. As it is an NDNA commitment, I think we would like to see the executive of the whole back that up with some level of funding. And that could potentially be something which would lead to additional support, particularly in terms of nurture and early intervention. Lord, I call Roy Beggs. Number two. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I say I am on record as uh, praising the tremendous efforts of all school leaders and staff, not only in their tireless work to support our vulnerable children, uh, the children of key workers and the thousands of pupils who have been educated through remote learning, but also in terms of significant amount of planning and preparation that was undertaken to get schools ready for the new term. I am grateful to have the opportunity to see the results of some of this work uh, firsthand. As regards to support, on 24 August 2020, I outlined a significant package of funding with the support of the Executive to help support the safe reopening of schools. The funding will, uh, will help pupils and principals to address some of the new pressures arising as a result of COVID and, in doing so, protect our children and young people, uh, as well as those working in educational settings. The package includes uh, £17.5 million towards the cost of substitute teachers and other uh, school expenditure, £6.4 million for PPE, £5 million for uh, school wellbeing initiatives, £3.1 million for uh, additional costs in terms of home to school transport, and uh, £1.4 million to support special educational needs. That is principally focused in on the first term of the new academic year. 
An updated version of the uh, COVID guidance for schools and education settings was also published on the 29th of September, which is intended to support principals and educational settings. The guidance outlines a range of additional supports which are available to schools, including a named uh, cross-organisational link officer for all schools, the Public Health Agency Helpline, dedicated Education Authority Helpline for schools who require advice in COVID, where a positive case has been identified, and a range of information of flowcharts is also available on the DE website um, and C2K uh, exchange. In addition to that, uh, in terms of through the monitoring rounds, uh, there has recently been additional allocations being made uh, to uh, the education sector. Uh, those are very recent, so consequently we will need to be uh, moving those through. But I think as one of the um, indications, I think there was about eight million was made available directly towards schools, in addition to a range of other issues, um, you know, which would cover, for instance, some of the EA pressures, including SEN. So there's, there is a range of support that's there. Not all of that as yet has been entirely uh, rolled out. Sorry, the figure, and also as part of that, sorry for schools, also to include the fact that there's been growth in the years 13 to 14. Sorry, the figure for schools was actually 10 million that was provided directly for that, and additionally another 1.8 million for non-statutory preschool settings. Roy Beg, supplementary. I'd firstly declare an interest in terms of uh, being a governor of Rodensfield School. And I too would like to join with the Minister in showing my appreciation for the staff and uh, teachers of all our schools in, in helping our ch children at present. But the Chancellor has recently extended the furlough scheme at least until March 21. Given that this recognition that the challenges of COVID-19 are going to extend at least until that time, what additional money does the Minister see coming to our schools to assist them with this challenge in keeping our children safe? Uh, and teachers protect it as they carry out this vital work? Well, as I indicated in terms of, I think, at the recent uh, monitoring rounds which have just taken place, uh, education as a whole received, first of all, on the October monitoring round, 12.8 million of what was bid for, and then on the COVID side of it, 49.4, of which 10 million was directly uh, related purely to schools on, on that side of it, a range of other actions that were there. It was also the case that in terms of PPE equipment, in addition to the 6.4 million, which was granted, I think, roughly speaking, about another 19 million has been granted, uh, which will help pay for PPE for all schools uh, and settings. So there are a range of, of activities. I mean, the member also, is, I'm sure, is aware that the furlough scheme, for instance, has been, as he rightly indicated, has been uh, extended. Obviously, with the exception of very limited circumstances, the furlough scheme doesn't particularly apply all that much directly to uh, the public sector in that regard, uh, albeit that, that uh, across the board people are able to take advantage of it. So it doesn't, while it has a major impact on Northern Ireland PLC, if I can put it that way, there isn't a direct Barnet consequential of the, the furloughs uh, being put in place, other than the fact that, that actually people in Northern Ireland will be able to avail of it. So there's not a particular additional block which comes into education as a result of the extension of the furlough scheme. I call Karen Mullen. Thank the Minister so far for his answers. Minister, a post-primary school in my constituency had to close um, after four days of reopening because the principal, the two vice principals, six teachers and all the canteen staff were, had a, had a self-isolate and it wasn't safe. So intervention is needed over and above the packages that you have mentioned there. I have highlighted with both yourself and the Health Minister the burden on principals in relation to tracking and tracing. I ask both your departments to work together to significantly enhance PHA's capacity in schools. Can you give us an update on the progress? Okay, just a couple of those issues. Obviously, in terms of uh, PHA, I think it's, uh, there is sort of a wider issue for the executive in terms of PHA obviously falls within the remit of the Department of Health. There is a wider um, opportunity, I think, that as we need as we move ahead to increase the availability of, of tracking and tracing. We've seen um, a situation, I think, within schools, I think there will be, uh, I think we'll be working with the Department of Health on a pilot scheme to ensure that actually that, that testing can be turned around at a quicker rate. And we've seen some examples, for instance, in England, where uh, they're doing sort of daily testing. So I think that is something that is moving on. Directly speaking, I suppose, in terms of the, the tracing people, uh, there is, I think, in terms of the protocols, and I appreciate this does create a burden for schools, but where there's someone has tested positive directly, particularly of a, of a, uh, a school student, 
uh, that the school is probably in the best position to identify those who have been directly close to those who have been sitting next to And that is the role which I think schools play in providing that level of information. I am glad she raised also, I think, uh, the issue specifically, I think, where we've seen probably a bigger problem at times in some areas is where there has been um, community spread within adults on that basis, and that has obviously impacted on staff. Sometimes, as well, some of the media reporting is not always entirely accurate. So I understand I've heard two slightly conflicting dates mentioned, but there was mention made, I think, in the school in question of, on the media of a fortnight of, of closure of remote learning. That is not the case, and I'm glad I think there's the opportunity to put that. I understand that. I think possibly on Thursday of this week they will be following a deep clean, and there will always be a knock-on effect on that, on that basis. On it. it is the, um, uh, the intention in terms of the way that the money has been made available for substitute cover, because you can get a school which is hit quite heavily. It is on the basis then of drawing down as much as possible within what is available on the basis of need, rather than a top-sliced allocation per school um, on that basis, because we have seen, for instance, on that basis... Enough, sir. Sorry, but half schools that there's been no cases at all, others where it's been deeper in that regard. So it's actually got to, be, to respond to the needs. Apologies. Thank you. Uh, call Sinead Bradley. Mr Speaker, uh, does the Minister agree with me that there is a real need now for a working group to be set up with stakeholders from across the educational sector to help you inform you on your decisions in the weeks and months ahead? I agree, but there's already been a stakeholder group set up. From the point of view of the advice that's been there, there's been a stakeholder group of school principals that have been meeting regularly and continue to meet and will be informed. And indeed, around a range of issues will provide that level of, uh, of work. In addition to that, there will also be discussions at times with, with the trade union representatives as well. So there is a stakeholder group. And to that extent, now, I think where there's a balance sometimes to be struck, sometimes in education, as with other things that have happened within COVID, there will be times where there has to be very quick reaction to things which will not mean that you can have everything convened. And if you were going to, and it's the balance between trying to get that level of consultation and be able to respond quickly, but a stakeholder group from that point of view of school principals, representing, I suppose, um, or at least encompassing um, all sections of education. So including all the different sectors, including primary, post-primary, at post-primary level, selective and non-selective, encompassing special schools as well. I think it's around about 20 school principals that we have uh, within that group who act as a level of, of sounding board and level of discussion. So that group is already there. As you say, the question five has been withdrawn, and I call Rosemary Barton. Question three, Minister. Question three. Okay. Sorry. Give me a second here. The Education Authority has established a special educational needs and disability strategic development programme which will incorporate work to reduce delays uh, within the SEN assessment process. The programme will also address recommendations from the Northern Ireland Children's Commissioner, Nicky report too little too late, the Northern Ireland Audit Office reports on SEN, and indeed the EA's own internal audit of practice report. The department is currently consulting on a new SEN framework, which will introduce new duties for the EA, schools and health designated to reduce timescales and bureaucracy in terms of the statutory assessment process. Actions are also ongoing to reduce delays in the statutory assessment progress through the EA's uh, improvement plan and the joint health and education notification referral and statutory assessment um, action plan, known as NRSA for short. Uh, I have established an SEN governance group to provide strategic oversight and coordination of the uh, overall programme of improvements within EA and the Department. And this group will provide uh, an assurance that the Department and the EA are working collaboratively to improve processes and, and procedures to achieve better outcomes for children with SEN. Rosemary Barton, supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Minister, you will be aware there are also long waiting lists for autism spectrum disorder assessments. Now, while I understand these are to be completed by the medical profession, this, however, has a knock-on effect when children are being assessed in school by the school psychologist. Can you commit to working with the Health Minister to reduce this assessment time for the educational benefits of our young people? I'll be very happy to and I think it's important that it's part of this. And I think that uh, this is about, and if, again, I suppose, like a lot of things, if there was simply a, a single intervention, would you mean that things would work quicker? I think 
it would have been taken sort of some time ago. So it's about we're trying to reduce the level of bureaucracy. We have seen in terms of um, speed of statements, while it's still far too long, there has been um, a reduction in terms of uh, the time taken um, on uh, assessments, and that is starting to work through the, the system. Obviously, COVID in and of itself, where there's direct individual assessments, has created its own problems, and we're trying to work around those. But I'm very happy to give that commitment to work uh, with the, um, the Health Minister and to continue to work between the two departments to try to make sure that we improve the lot for um, anybody with autism or indeed in the wider special educational needs. I call Gemma Dolan. Yep. Minister, you've touched on this briefly in your previous answer, but can I ask you for your assessment on the impact uh, that the onset of COVID has had on referral waiting times of primary school pupils for special educational needs assessments and what action you are taking to address this? To be fair, I think despite COVID, there has been some levels of improvements. So, um, for example, on the, the basis between July and September, the percentage of statements that were completed within time, I think, rose by about 11 per cent on that basis. So there, there, are, there are some positives. And indeed, as part of that, uh, and that is across the board, I know the member had um, realised and uh, mentioned in terms of that, I think there's, uh, there's been improvements within Fermanagh South Tyrone, for instance. Um, and indeed, uh, in terms of what I think was something that was very unacceptable, on the basis of the number of children, for instance, who were waiting more than 40 weeks, which would be 14, um, outside of that, there's been an 83% improvement where that number has gone down from 265 to 44. Undoubtedly, and I think probably in terms of some of the assessments that were there earlier in the year, COVID has had, and I think there was, for all of us, I believe, trying to, um, including those even within the medical profession, trying to make an assessment of what was doable on the ground I suppose there was a level of reticence that was there. None of us knew precisely uh, what was coming down the, the track. But we have seen some levels of improvement, but we've got to consistently uh, push that. I mean, to take another example, uh, and again, it's a fairly appalling statistic. Back, um, if we go back exactly a year ago, we had 107 children who had been waiting uh, over a year and a half in terms of uh, completion of the statutory assessment. That figure, in terms of uh, more than a year and a half, is now down to zero. I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the answers to the question so far. Minister, for some time now, there has been a long and lingering crisis in SEN, many children and families struggling, and that has been worsened as a result of this pandemic. Minister, do you feel your department has done enough to support those families, particularly in the absence of schools that have, been, have proven vital uh, to these children and their development over the course of the last number of years? And do you feel it is satisfactory, Minister, that SEN schools were not included in the Engage programme funding, which is vitally important and has angered quite a lot of parents? Well, I've indicated, first of all, as regards to the SEN, but that I've directed EA to be working directly with those schools then to actually provide individual interventions and where they can provide that level of support and EA, there's a, an onus on them to, to do that. As regards that, I think there, as I indicated, I think there has been some good work. There is improvements being made. Can more be done? Yes, we're not at the, the end game. And I think there is always a danger with anything within public life of seeing it as an event, whereas in fact it's part of a process, but we need to make sure that process is, is continuing on. That is also part of, from a strategic point of view, why the SEN regulations, we put those out to consultation with the idea uh, of, at the end of that process, new mm -hmm. SEN regulations and a code of practice being put in place, and that will be of help as well. As with everything, though, will there be instantaneous answers or improvements? No, those will not happen instantaneously, but I think we need to be constantly moving in the right direction um, on this. But ultimately, can more be done? Yes, and more will be done. I call Martin Anderson. Question number four. Uh, right. Uh, the department doesn't hold a, sort of a daily specific information on the number of pupils and staff who, who have been or are currently self-isolating. However, pupil, we do capture pupil attendance data uh, using the school information management systems, using a reapportioned attendance code, which is not uh, solely sort of for COVID. That is over the first couple of months averaged about 2 per cent per week. It reached a peak point um, in the week commencing the 12th of October at 5.6 per cent. Those are on the basis of uh, where pupils are receiving direct uh, uh, support learning and indeed engaging directly in remote learning uh, via sort of self-isolating or shielding. 
Uh, as regards uh, teachers, and again, the, the overall figures we had, uh, were produced by PHA, who monitored the figures, had identified uh, prior to the Halloween break that I think the figures were in total were about a little bit over 2,000 pupils, sorry, 2,000 um, who were in some way connected with schools, the breakdown of being about 1,400 of those being pupils and about 600 being staff, that over that eight-week eight week period, cumulatively, um, had, uh, uh, had tested positive for COVID. And indeed, again, the fluctuation is largely speaking that the figures within schools largely reflect what is there within, um, within the wider community. As regards staff, the most recent available figures are over the 13th of October and show around about 90% of teaching and non-teaching staff were on site on that particular day. Uh, of the 1 in 10 staff reported as not working on site, school categorised just over a third of those as having been identified by PHA testing and tracing to self-isolate, so a little bit over 3%. Uh, it should also be noted that half of staff not working on site were reported to be re uh, working remotely. We should also remember that you put this in a context in terms of staff, that on average the, the bill for substitute tasks staff in a normal year is around about 100 million, uh, which is a little bit shy of 10 per cent of the overall wage figure, so we need to put that in context as well. Martina Anderson, supplementary. Good. Um, Minister, as you know, uh, principals in Derry and, and across the north are doing their utmost to protect pupils, and they have carried the burden of tracking and tracing, and I've been listening to some of your comments today, but I don't see, um, is there a dedicated support being given to principals in Derry and elsewhere who are carrying this burden on their shoulder. And I don't think that what you've outlined today actually tells them there's enough support being given to them. There is a, a dedicated helpline that is there from PHA that is there directly where schools can contact. In terms of tracing the individuals who are close to, um, and indeed we should remember that what is being said in terms of close contacts, it is largely speaking those who are within two metres for more than 15 minutes. The only people who are in, or in the best position to be able to determine that are people within the schools uh, themselves. So there is that level of, of support. Look, as with everything in relation to this, there is support that is, is there. Um, and I, I don't think from that point of view that I'm not suggesting that in education in any way has been unfairly treated in terms of the level of support. As with a lot of things, if there was much greater level of support that was available, could more be done? Yes, it could do. But I'm, I'm confident that what has been put in place is at least something that provides the maximum amount of support that is available, given the level of resources. And that's irrespective of where uh, the school is based. Um, we have a situation where, across the board, um, the latest figures we suggested that, roughly speaking, about half schools haven't, haven't had a single case, and in half schools there's been at least one case. And of those. Uh, remaining schools, um, there was about half of those who had been a single incident involving one individual. But schools, I think, will largely reflect what is happening in the community. I don't believe that schools themselves are particularly, because it's a relatively controlled environment, are somewhere where COVID is, is particularly, uh, there is a major problem with it spreading. The problem is actually, I think, a range of the activities that happen alongside uh, schools. And we're seeing this within the wider context. As numbers hopefully continue to come down in terms of COVID, I think we'll see reductions. If they go up, I suspect schools will tend to reflect that as well. Chris Little, I call. Mr Speaker, can I ask the Education Minister how many P7 pupils have had to self-isolate since schools reopened in August? Um, in terms of directly P7 pupils, I don't have the direct figures to hand, but I'll get those for them. What I have indicated uh, in terms of, we know the figures that are directly there in terms of uh, pupils across the board who have tested positive uh, for that, but um, we will take a look and see what figures are directly available, and I'll happy to write to the member with um, any information that we have broken down as much as possible. And that ends the period for a list of questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Minister, further to the Northern Ireland Assembly's um, unanimous vote, can I ask when the Minister will set out a clear contingency plan for um, the post-primary transfer tests or post-primary transfer this year? Well, as I indicated at, at the time on it, I think contingencies need to be put in place. But the people who are actually legally who are doing this are, first of all, the schools that can set their own criteria and the organisations which, which put in place. Now, we will make sure that everything is put in place uh, as regards health and safety for the individuals. But from that point of view, I don't believe, I think it runs contrary to the law 
runs contrary to the right of schools to have academic selection. And you know, I, I appreciate the member myself will take a very different view in relation to that. I support the right of academic uh, selection. It is clearly the case that schools have the opportunity, if they so desire, not to use that. But I am not going to try to impose on schools the removal of academic selection. Kelly Armstrong, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Then, following on from that, and I appreciate the minister may not be able to provide me with this information here today, but if you could get that to me, can the minister provide a breakdown of how many times meetings there has been with AQE and PPTC to his department, his ministerial office, and a special advisor, please? Happy to get any information that is there in terms of any meetings. There will also be discussions. I mean, look, the point is we want to ensure the children are operating in a safe environment when it comes to transfer or tests. But again, we should need to put this into context, as I indicated, I think, in the debate. To put this in context, uh, there will be on the particular Saturdays where this is being sat, around about 10,000 on each occasion, uh, people to be sitting that. Uh, there are a range of mitigation measures that are put in place in relation to that, but that is also against a context in which, on a daily basis, we will have over 300,000 children going into schools on a, on a daily basis. So, it is about trying to ensure that, that any health and safety mitigations are put in place. But in terms of the specifics of any discussions that are uh, within that, I'm sure we'll get the details to the member. I call Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister recently announced that there are some additional £170 million for local government to support um, the holiday hunger issue, uh, free school meals during the holiday period. Can the Minister advise, is a Barnet consequential for that funding, and is there a commitment for ongoing funding in this area in Northern Ireland? Well, in terms of, I would say in terms of that we would need considerably more than a Barnet consequential because the levels of children that, for instance, would qualify for free school meals is of a greater nature than, than would be uh, across the water. What I would say is that, again, um, it did seem that, that in this was a case which the Westminster government actually followed in behind what the devolved administrations and as the members are aware, uh, the executive data proposal had been put to ensure that, uh, for instance, as a result of the additional week off, that, um, that initially that that would be covered and indeed the executive, because strictly speaking, outside of term time lies outside the legal remit of the Department of Education. But what we did find was across the spectrum um, of the executive, there has been a considerable willingness and support so unanimously, I don't think I'm breaching any um, executive confidentiality. Uh, during the, the recent Halloween break, um, we agreed to support uh, the full payment uh, across both weeks. That is a similar position to what was adopted uh, both during the period whenever schools were, um, were effectively uh, more or less not meeting face to face during the March to June period, and also the, the executive agreed provision over the, uh, over the period um, over the summer. Now, we're scoping out uh, what needs to be done in terms of cost that will be there for um, the Christmas period and beyond, and I think that the executive, I think, uh, given what has happened in the past, will step up to the market and provide that level of, uh, of support. I think one of the things that needs to be scoped out will be there will be additional uh, level of weekly cost as we're likely, as time moves on, that those, for instance, on universal credit, sadly, will increase. And so, therefore, there will be a, probably a higher cost per week. But I think there is a strong commitment from the executive to tackle uh, the issue. And again, I suspect that we will be ahead of the curve compared with Westminster. Right, back. supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. There is considerable research within the UK uh, about holiday hunger programmes not only providing food, but constructive physical and educational activity for disadvantaged children during particularly summer and, and holiday periods. Uh, so has the Minister uh, uh, any plans to continue to develop and provide such constructive activity, raise the educational attainment uh, of disadvantaged young people within Northern Ireland, and in particular within my, Carrick, my East Antrim constituency and Carrick Fergus, where the YMCI have been involved in doing such a, providing such a scheme? Work has been done by particularly third parties in relation to that. I suppose tackling the absolutely immediate issue will be around the pure issue of holiday hunger and what level of support needs to be done there. But in addition to that, um, particularly as regards to the academic side, that while there's been a focus, for instance, on the level of support that's been there in terms of academic catch-up during term time, there was investment, first of all, on a number of initiatives over the summer of this year. 
There will be through youth service a range of um, very bespoke interventions uh, that have taken place. One, I suppose, one area where there's maybe been a little bit of constraint in terms of some of the uh, direct help that's able to be done um, has been particularly there's been a limit maybe on what can be done directly through youth activity through COVID and the, the ability to have, for instance, while there have been bespoke summer schemes, to have those as wide as they ideally should be uh, has been limited a little bit by, by COVID. Hopefully, again, we will move to a situation which we move away uh, from that. But the work particularly of the youth sector in this uh, is critical, and I pay tribute to the hard work that they have done throughout this, sometimes not particularly uh, as well recognised, perhaps, as, as uh, what is there in the more sort of formal education system. Nicole, William Irwin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, could the Minister outline how many digital devices have been provided to pupils and how his department is dealing with the issue of internet con connectivity uh, for the pupils who use families are financially disadvantaged? In terms of the uh, amount of figures, I think, um, in terms of the level of, of uh, support that has been there, um, We've been in a position where, obviously, with a three-stage process, as of um, 31st October, there's about 8,300 devices had been directly sort of uh, put out. In addition to that, there's also been the EA has um, obtained uh, a number of um, the MiFi devices in terms of uh, quality with built-in data allowances. We work closely in terms with uh, BT in terms of that. I mean. One of the challenges here, there's, there's roughly, I think, still about 3,000 in the system that there's available to, to draw down on. But I think we've also indicated that uh, if there's a need for further within this year, we'll be looking towards DOF to see if there's any additional capital can be drawn down uh, within that. That has effectively been focused in on uh, a range of groups, but particularly on a socioeconomic disadvantage uh, side of it. And I think the, the, the level of connectivity is also critical because there will be, particularly in some rural areas, where you can have all the devices in the world until there's actually that connectivity ruled out, which is why I suppose that we need to ensure that uh, my colleague, um, the Economy Minister, is rolling out the project stratum to try to ensure that broadband width is, is um, then escalated within those areas as well, to try to make sure that we've got that uh, marrying in between the, the two. William Irwin, supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your response. And, uh, and we are aware that additional funding was offered to schools to assist in providing extra assistance for, to children in catching up on lost time in school. Will there be further funds available for schools in this regard to widen the availability of this extra assistance to enable more pupils to benefit? As I said, we will constantly be exploring what is needed in terms of direct digital devices. There has been so far a package which was agreed by the Executive of £12 million, uh, that has gone into the uh, programme in terms of catch-up. There were a number of smaller initiatives over the summer, but the main one being about 11.2 million, which is into the Engage programme. That will take us up to uh, the end of March of this year, and we will need, as a department, to bid for probably around about four to five million to complete the project uh, in terms of in terms of June. Uh, and that will have positive spin-offs, not simply in terms of what is there for pupils, but uh, also, I think, will provide some levels of additional opportunities, for instance, for substitute teachers on the, the list to be able to provide that direct level of intervention. There is the opportunity given to schools to be able to uh, apply that money in a way which uh, they can decide where it is best placed. And there will also be, as an addition to that, because uh, that is obviously on the pure academic side of it, there will also be additional money which will be very shortly distributed in terms of mental health and wellbeing, but we have specific support on COVID beyond simply what will be provided um, under normal circumstances in terms of that, that issue, because it's both a healthy mind, um, both sort of from a mental health point of view and from an academic point of view, and it's about marrying in the two. I call Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Minister, it is all too well documented in terms of special education and the assessments and indeed the waiting times, but can you give us an, out an outline of the impact of the coronavirus as having actually on that assessment process? Well, I think as I indicated earlier, uh, we have seen in terms of the assessment process, uh, there have been very big figures previously. We have seen a levels of reduction. So, for example, in terms of meeting the statutory assessment period, there has been an improvement, um, particularly between June and September on the levels of those uh, that are, if you like, being met within time. There is also, I think, provision 
as I indicated, for those at the far end of the, the scale who have been waiting for a very long period of time. We have seen over the period of the year that number coming down from 107, who are waiting, I think, 80 weeks or more, down to zero on that basis. It is part of an overall process. There is no doubt, I think, that some level of disruption took place, uh, particularly during the spring term, uh, in terms of the levels of direct assessment that were there. And again, as part of that as a society as a whole, there was a level of barriers where, where people were maybe feeling a bit uncertain over what, uh, what could be done and what, what couldn't be done. And indeed, probably the lines of communication were not as strong as, as they would be under normal circumstances as well. Trevor Clark, supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer? Would the Minister attribute any of that to actually remote working within the education setting and maybe give an assessment actually how many people are continuing to remotely work and when he anticipates those people will be back to work as normal? Well, in terms of um, given indications earlier on in terms of uh, staff within schools, um, I think within the broader process of what's happening, for instance, in terms of educational psychologists, in terms of health, I don't have those figures directly uh, to hand. What I would say is, I think, again, from my experience of having seen some special schools, I think there is a critical intervention, particularly, that is there where that face-to-face -face teaching is taking place. I think that is of benefit throughout the system, but it's particularly pertinent for those in special educational needs. I call Paula Bradshaw. It's, um, thank you, Education Minister. It's in relation to an oral or a written question that you um, wrote back to me about in terms of ventilation in the classrooms, and you've said you're sort of following the evidence and watching how it um, develops. I'm just wondering, are you setting aside some funding for the school estate where, as we move into the winter, um, it might not be possible for schools to keep their windows open? Well, look, there's direct PHA advice in terms of the, the maximum amount of ventilation we can, we can take place. Uh, that could be provided. Now, I appreciate, and I think schools have also got to apply this from a sensible point of view, because I know I've also had some parents who have contacted saying, the window's open, why are the windows open? Well, it's actually to, to have ventilation, but then I think that does mean that schools will need to also have a level of adaptation, for example, even just in terms of what way they will look at school uniforms and whether uh, you know, there's extra layers of clothing, whether there's additional bits. I think that there's got to be common sense solutions in, in connection with that. Uh, the money that is being made available, available to schools will meet a range of um, issues, and it is not by its nature hypothecated to say, you know, you need to spend this on a particular way. So there's a level of freedom given to schools uh, that, that will be there. Uh, you know, there is obviously a concern that if you've got high levels of ventilation, that there will be some knock-on effect in terms of additional colds or whatever. But as with a lot of things with uh, meeting the challenges of COVID, you know, there is not... There's rarely a solution which then produces something so virtuous that it doesn't create some level of complications with it as well. Paula Bradshaw, supplementary, we have about a minute and a half left. Okay, is that your language? Okay, members, uh, Matthew O'Toole. Speaker, I got in very brief. I'll get in very briefly. I'll try and be concise. Uh, Minister, whenever your panel, uh, expert panel on educational, edu educational underachievement comes back, if they find that academic selection is a clear cause of educational underachievement among disadvantaged people, would you take action? Well, uh, to use it, um, maybe I'm, without upsetting other people in the House, the, the education panel hasn't gone away, you know, on that, on that regard. So in terms of educational underachievement, they are actually continuing to make, they're receiving submissions and indeed making a range of that. Specifically, the, the issue of transfer between primary and post-primary, it's largely focused in on the wider review of education. The terms of reference, I think, have been certainly have, have signed off on them going to the Education Committee in terms of draft terms. That will still have to go through the Executive. So that's probably the best place uh, for that. And I think there is always a danger in terms of underachievement um, that particularly the media will focus in on what happens at 11, when actually a lot of the lessons are really what happens much before that. And time is up. And could I ask members to take your ease for a moment or two? Thank you.